uh, what your CTO would be thinking and is thinking in regards to cloud computing versus what we call premise-based computing, which many of you would be familiar with. And of course, Microsoft is answering the call on cloud computing with their offerings, which are referred to as, as Azure. So you might hear of Windows Azure, SQL Azure, all of these um, options that Azure has. Uh, and Adam, if you wouldn't mind, uh, forward into the next, that'd be great. So here you've got the options from Microsoft, um, and, and what it is that are the opportunities for your CTOs to look at um, options in the cloud that Microsoft would offer. Um, this would again be options as opposed to premise-based install solutions and running these on your own servers, as we do here at Pragmatic Works. Um, at Pragmatic Works over the last seven years, we've had the options to build out our own IT infrastructure for applications um, that we would need to run our business. And after looking at um, different options, we opted to run the majority of our business, uh, pretty much 13 out of the 15 applications that run our business are all in the cloud. And the reasons for that, I'll go through in the next few slides for you, Adam. So many of the uh, same questions that we had here internally at Pragmatic Works are the questions that your CTOs are answering as well. And of course, Pragmatic Works is a, a smaller business, and many of you in the audience here today um, range from small businesses to uh, enterprise-level businesses. So the adoption of cloud will be similar to what you, I, I would expect to see in the polls that we saw today. Um, the adoption of cloud into the enterprise is going to be much slower than it is for businesses like Pragmatic Works, but the reasons for adopting the cloud remain the same. Um, and one of the reasons, uh, I'm trying to sum it up today, there's many reasons to, uh, that your CTO would look at cloud computing, but at the end of the day, it's all about trying to provide the same IT services to the business um, at the lowest cost uh, per uh, compute. Yeah, we can go to the next one. So what does the lowest cost per compute really mean? How do you break that down as a CTO? How I looked at it here at Pragmatic Works, how Adam and I look at it together. And you look at um, a number of factors, but the top six that I could uh, come up for this webinar today are things like real estate cost, uh, administration of the servers and the applications uh, internally, uh, infrastructure, buying the hardware, the, the networking support, and so on. Uh, power, just maintaining the utility and electrical bill for uh, that IT infrastructure. A light licensing and maintenance. How much does it cost to license the software that you have on those machines? And then what's it cost to make sure you're up to date and that you're managing all the upgrades of that software? And lastly, and a very important factor that many of you may not be aware of, is that your, your CTOs, your business, um, are looking at a tax advantage that you get by having a cloud computing solution as opposed to an internal premise-based solution. And that is a capital expense versus an operational expense. And what I'll do over the next few slides is delve into each of these areas a little bit just so you um, hopefully understand what it is, what are the pressures that your business is having to move from a premise-based solution to a cloud-based cloud solution. So here, for example, we'll dive into the real estate cost. Uh, many of us go to work every day. Uh, we do our jobs. We maintain our, our, our databases, our applications. We're doing development. Uh, and don't really consider the cost um, of having the real estate around us that we go to work and report to. Um, what a CTO will look at when they look at real estate costs and the, and the ability to save money by moving an application or a database to the cloud would be how many servers are housed uh, for that application, where are they housed, and what's it cost to maintain that space. Um, so as you're in your, uh, in your data center today, you may just want to consider uh, depending on the city that you're in, I was going to delve into actual averages here, but everybody's from all over the world when they join our webinars. But uh, think about the, the square footage of your data center. Think about the city that it's in. Things like real estate taxes, property taxes, and those things that are associated with the cost of that real estate center. And then um, with that uh, real estate. And then also consider the maintenance and even the cleaning of that space. So, you know, upkeep of things like uh, the plumbing like the electricity, like the ceilings and the, the painting and things of that nature. All of that cost go into the cost of maintaining that real estate. And it is something that's considered by your CTO when moving something to the cloud. And you know, Tim, it's interesting because a lot of folks, 
think, well, is, is real estate really, I mean, are they really thinking about that? I mean, we have conversations, I know you and I have had conversations with C-level executives with our customers, mm -hmm. where they're talking about, you know, it's not even just the space that the servers take up, it's are we going to have to move locations to get a bigger server room or to get more, you know, space for staff that's actually generating revenue for the company and those types of things, whereas if you went back and said you could take 25% of that server room and reclaim it for office space or additional space to generate revenue and move all of those servers and the additional storage and all those things, some of the things we'll talk about later, up into the cloud and let that be managed for you, uh, not the whole enterprise, but the part that, that, that's a good fit. Uh, you know, it's, it really is a, a, a very cool thought process to be able to think about how you can begin to reclaim the investment you've already made uh, and begin to double down there. No, that's a good point, Adam. One of the things I didn't put on the slide here is, is you're right, future build-outs. So not only the existing space, but as you grow, which most, most companies are growing in the data center today, what's it going to cost to have that future build-out? Yeah, and we ran into that at Pragmatic Works, so that's a very good point. Um, IT administration costs, and this one stings a little bit, right, because it's personal. It, it comes down to uh, we're all employees of companies. We all, uh, of course, have our cost associated with being an employee, but it is the number one expense that um, an, an IT budget has. It, oh, most companies' bottom line have in it is the employee and the payroll expense. Uh, so it is something that needs to be considered. It's probably the first thing that's considered, and it's not that the jobs go away when you go to the cloud but they certainly change, and, and Adam will talk a little bit about that later on uh, in the webinar today, but also throughout the week with Azure, you might want to look at uh, Jason Strait's webinar, Brian Knight's webinar. They're going to talk a lot about, as a developer and a DBA, how your world changes if your applications go to the cloud, and what are the skill sets you're going to need to adapt to, to, you know, um, to move, with, uh, move your, your career with it. Um, but again, these are the big expenses that a CTO will consider uh, with the cloud. And of course, you've got to think of things like healthcare and benefits. And with the new healthcare laws that are out, um, the cost to maintain a single employee on healthcare has become very, very um, expensive. So, uh, Adam, we'll go to the next one. Thank you. Um, infrastructure cost. Of course, this is a no-brainer, right? Um, as you move uh, an application to the cloud along with the database, um, you'll find that, of course, you're no longer having the hardware refreshes that you have. And uh, each organization is different in how they go ahead and maintain and purchase hardware, what the schedule is to do that. But, of course, it's very expensive to uh, go out and purchase those servers on an annual basis or biannual basis, depreciate those servers, uh, all the peripherals that go along with maintaining that infrastructure and the network, the networking costs to do that as well. Um, also, another thing you may want to consider just when thinking about the cost of the infrastructure is the data center uh, security. Um, many times it's overlooked, but these are the costs in making sure that access and, and uh, rights to the data center are actually maintained. So there's additional costs beyond just the people that are running the servers and the applications. Yeah, Tim, that's a great point. You know, we are going to talk about that a little bit more in detail uh, a little bit later, but one of the things about this that's so exciting to me is, you know, when you look at not just the infrastructure cost, but the cost of, you know, many organizations, especially when we were having, you know, some of our, our you know, recent recessionary issues and some of those kinds of things where companies were cutting back, you know, a few years ago, and, uh, you know, we saw a lot of customers keeping hardware for longer than they would depreciate it for, right? So they would depreciate it off after three years, They'd keep it for five years and, and really suffer performance and reliability and increased maintenance costs and just downtime that was probably never really measured but really felt throughout the enterprise. And, you know, when you talk about doing things in the cloud, you don't have to worry about any of that anymore. If you want to make sure you have the newest server, not a problem. They're going to make sure that, that, that what you have running on is, is new and powerful and, and cutting edge and maintained and secure and all that kind of good stuff. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more, but all of those IT you know, typical planning headaches and which sand do we put this on and I don't want that one because we can't reboot it and that one doesn't have a support contract but this one does and all of those kinds of questions that you run into in, in a larger enterprise, they largely go away because they're all being managed and, and managed well uh, by a cloud provider. So it's a really, yeah. uh, you know, it seems like that one should be the one that's the, the biggest no-brainer but it's the one that most most organizations don't even fix for themselves when, when they have it under their own control. So it's a lot easier to let somebody else uh, you know, run with that in the long term. Yeah, and you think about it internally, Adam, right? How often we sit down and talk about upgrades to the applications we built and 
um, what type of time and effort goes into that, right? Uh, all of that, oh, right, yeah. will go away, right? So all the committee right. meetings and so on, and um, it. For instance, uh, for those of you out there, we use Office 365 here at Pragmatic Works, and it's not, uh, it, you don't even think about updates uh, to exchange into the email system. It automatically happens, it's done, and uh, you know, it's not a cost to our business other than the subscription per person. So, no, it's a, it's a good point, Adam. Um, another, another cost that goes into a data center that's very, very uh, large and is actually increasing um, at, a, at a very low uh, high rate is the cost of power, uh, the cost of electricity to go ahead and, and keep that data center up and running. Um, utility costs have not gone down. They continue to go up. And your CTO is going to think about that. They're going to look at that and say, okay, look, um, not only the things we've gone through so far in the slides, but they're going to look at the utility costs to maintain that, that data center. And not only to run the machines and things, and what I was hoping to point, put out in this webinar today are the sort of oddball things that you may not consider, like air conditioning, for example. Just making sure you maintain that, that optimum temperature in the room uh, costs the company an awful lot of money, and that's the type of cost that would go away um, if an application was moved to the cloud. So again, another compelling reason for a CTO to sit down and put together a budget to try to lower the cost to compute, which is, again, the goal of your CTO, to provide a quality service at the lowest cost to compute. Okay, go to the next one there, Adam. And uh, we touched a little bit on this, licensing and maintenance, um, in the last slide. But, you know, it is something that's exorbitant, as you guys uh, probably uh, can feel and see. This may land in your world quite a bit as you go ahead and you upgrade your SQL Server licenses, for example, to 2012, and you have X amount of services, uh, servers and instances licensed. Um, upgrading through service packs and so on, that's a very costly and time-consuming uh, process for your business, and when um, SQL Server, uh, I think it's Platform as a Service, will be available in Azure, it will become a compelling uh, option for your CTO, if it's not already today, um, where they can move the databases to the cloud and save an awful lot on this. Now, the interesting thing here, it's not like a 100% savings, it's not that good, right? Uh, it is something where you still have to pay uh, by compute, you got to pay for subscription in some models, and so your CTO will balance that cost versus your current cost and see if there's an, uh, an ROI there. But this will no doubt become an option that has to be looked at by your CTOs. All right, Adam, and I think we'll go to the, the final and real it's an interesting thing. The interesting thing about licensing before you jump forward, the interesting yeah. thing about licensing is, you know, one that's a lot of times that's not factored in like you mentioned, but the other thing is depending upon how you deploy in Azure, most of that licensing is truly managed for you, um, whether it's in platform or even in VMs and those kinds of things which we're going to talk about uh, in a little bit. So there is a significant savings, uh, which in a lot of cases, as you mentioned before about jobs not going away, mm -hmm. a lot of times that savings can be put forward into uh, you know, additional compensation or additional resources for folks who are strategically helping the company move in the right direction. Yeah, you're, you're spot on with that. I mean, a CTO needs to not only save money, but they also need to manage the growth. They need to make sure the business is performing and, and come up with those ideas that can allow the business to perform, uh, to grow and to perform more efficiently, right? So that's where we want to put the money as C-level folks. You don't want to sit and put the money into things that don't grow your business. You want to put the money into things that can grow your business. So you're, you're right on there, Adam, that the savings that goes here uh, it doesn't just go to the bottom line. It goes into how you can grow your business and focus more on the product or service that your business does sell. Um, right. So, yeah, it's a, it's, uh, that's exactly the goal. Uh, and that's kind of what this slide is about too, right? Yeah, it is. It is, actually. Um, so, you know, one of the things that uh, a lot of us in IT would not be aware of is that there is, in fact, a very big tax advantage to your CTO and to your business uh, to move, operation, to move um, applications to the cloud. And this gets a little bit, a bit detailed, but I wanted to sum it up in the, in the webinar um, so that you're just aware of it, that, again, why, why would your company consider moving applications to the cloud? That's the question here today. Uh, they would do it uh, for the reasons I put forth. And also, this is a main reason that would come from your CFO, for example, to the CTO, just saying, look, you know, we can go ahead. And today, if we go out and we purchase the equipment, if we purchase uh, the building of a data center, you can, those are capital expenses that have to be depreciated over a five-year period. Um, when you go to an operational expense, 
it to the cloud and you're paying by subscription uh, or you're paying by compute, those are immediately deductible uh, operational expenses, which is a big advantage to a business. Um, so that will be, this will be probably uh, uh, one of the top six, as I put in here, uh, it depends on the business and what the, how much they actually depreciate, but um, this will be one of the top six reasons why your CTO will be asking you to um, consider the cloud, perhaps, you know, uh, working within the cloud. Anything to add there, Adam, or you pretty much, you and I have had well, that think, one out. You know, I think, it's, uh, I think folks don't think about that, right? I think they think that, you know, that, well, you know, it's really just servers here, servers there, or, you know, we're going to have to rebuild our application from scratch, or we're not, you know, cloud ready. I'm making air quotes, but you guys can't see that, right? And so, you know, I think that the thing we're trying to do with this week, and we have another week coming up in May, is, is to talk about, you know, how that's sort of a myth, right? We got to we need to bust some of those myths and and you know talk about why the cloud really is the best strategic option. You know, it's one of the those four key scorecard items. You know, for every C level executive, you know, when they're talking about you know building out their organization from a technology perspective. And so, hopefully, this will be a, a good informative week to get those juices flowing with a lot of uh, a lot of our folks here on the on the free train. Yeah, yeah, I think it will be. I, I think that's, again, the, the reason for the, the week is to help everybody understand that this is really, um, uh, it is something that over the next couple of years, three years, depending on the size of your enterprise and the, and the importance of the applications, and you know, that you will be looking at a cloud option, that your CTOs will have to. So uh, it, it is a good week to go and say, okay, if we do move to the cloud, what are the skill sets that I'm going to need? And that's uh, interesting. Hopefully it's helpful for everybody. And Adam, I'll... Um, well, you've actually already got the slides, so I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and just uh, go on mute for you. Okay, no worries. So, uh, folks, like I, like Tim talked about earlier, you know, we're talking about sort of why uh, the the cloud is your best strategic option. Tim kind of went through a, a number of good options for, you know, what your C level execs and your VPs and your your um, your line of business folks are going to be thinking about and asking about. And you know, I can tell you from experience, we meet with you know a number of customers every week where they're really concerned about how to deploy things like big data, how to do data center, data center consolidation, how to get their SQL license footprint uh, down without sacrificing performance and elasticity. And so, you know, this is not going to be a deep technical dive. What I want to try to do is set you guys up for this week and for all of the smart folks we have presenting this week and take you through a high level view of what Azure provides from a cloud perspective and why that actually matters, right? So we're not going to do every single little Azure feature. Uh, we're not going to do the, all the little nitty-gritty details, but I'm going to go through a host of different options and why uh, there's sort of such a powerful message there. And the first piece is there's a truly global footprint. And <clears throat> I've got some dots here that represent some of the major areas where you know Microsoft has significant presence from an Azure perspective. They're adding to that regularly, and so this may or may not be completely up to date, but uh, they're adding those data centers in pairs, and that's the important thing to remember. Everything is highly available. Everything is geolocated. All of these expensive replication software uh, tools that you pay for and some of those things, a lot of those go away. Uh, your HADR is all to is, can be taken care of. Your high availability, your load balancing, you're scaling across continents. I had a customer the other day, I was sitting in their, uh, sitting in their conference room with them, and uh, actually, Tim, it was right up was when we were up in uh, up in New England. They're talking to you guys, and they said, you know, that's great. We love this big data application we want to deploy. We've also got these SQL databases we need to manage. We've also got these, uh, you know, other uh, sort of hosted applications we need to manage. But how do I do that and keep all the back end data in sync across three continents? Because we're a global business. I said, look, you, you don't need. He said, I'd really love to see case studies and white papers on what your customers have done and how they engage the telco companies and how much that costs. And I go, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> there's a much better way to do this, right? You do not want to go build your own mini telco to support enterprise applications, and that's what so many organizations have had to do over the course of the the 90s and 2000s, just to be able to get the level of replication, availability, and performance. They're literally building out mini telcos. I can remember when I was at Toyota, what we had, and it was just, it was huge. Uh, and most of that is all gone. It's been dismantled. And uh, they're, they're doing some exciting things. And many other organizations are taking advantage of that as well. This is one of my favorite parts. You pay for only for what you use. I think that's fair. 
So you, it's like Tim mentioned, you're only going to pay for compute if you're using the platform services. If you're using VMs, you're not going to pay when those are running. Uh, you know, you're only going to pay for what you use. There's no big upfront subscription fees. There's none of that. Uh, you just go in, set up an account, and we'll talk about that uh, a little bit more in a few minutes. Uh, like I mentioned, no upfront costs. You're getting down to you know per minute and per hour billing. So when jobs aren't running, so you literally have the capability to do things like, I'm going to go scale up these machines. I'm going to run my job or my processing or my ETL or something on you know 15 servers instead of one. I'm going to get it done in a hundredth of the time, and then I'm just going to shut them all down. And I can do that because I'm being billed per minute per hour. There's no charge for stop VMs. And I can manage and automate it all with PowerShell. And that is an incredibly powerful combination to be able to deliver flexibility and elasticity for any type of workload in your environment. And so a lot of you are probably familiar with the platform services of the cloud and you know things like, well, my database doesn't fit yet or you know those types of things. It'll fit up to 150 gigs. And I would tell you to seriously look at your uh, your tier two, tier three applications, those line of business applications. Uh, I've been involved in four or five migrations now, just even in the last couple of months, and they've all gone pretty smoothly. You know, databases, we made a couple of code changes here and there. The app, we made a couple of code changes here and there. Uh, but all in all, you're talking about, you know, something that's done in days, not even weeks or months or anything like that. So, you know, we can take advantage of all of the things that Azure has to offer. Uh, one of my favorite things that a lot of our customers use is just the Azure Virtual Machines. It's a great way to get started in the Azure Cloud, get to understand the automation capabilities, all of the load balancing and high availability features, and it supports Windows Server and Linux virtual machines. It's got flexible workload support. You can manage it through VPN or private or virtual networks, either one, uh, whichever one you uh, would prefer to deploy. We also have virtual networking in the cloud, which I'll talk about a little bit in a few minutes. But from the virtual machine perspective, one of the things that's most exciting is, if you remember, no charge for stop VMs, right? So if I use my VMs and I don't want to run them all the time, what kind of flexibility does that give me? Well, it gives me a lot of flexibility because I can do things like I can deploy my enterprise BI up in Azure in virtual machines. And when I run my ETL, I can run it on a much larger machine by itself without having to figure out, does it share with reporting services? Does it share with analysis services? And who's the trade-off with? And then I can just shut it down at the end of the day. Going back to what Tim mentioned, instead of hosting and managing an ETL server for five years, and what does that depreciation look like? And what does that upfront cost look like? And the build-out and the maintenance, I can automate the build-out and maintenance of that very, very easily with PowerShell up in the cloud and I can power it down after my ETL runs. So if my ETL only runs for three to six hours a day, that's huge. Now I'm only paying for three to six hours a day of power to run that ETL. Maybe it's on, maybe it's on a mid-grade machine that runs about two bucks an hour. What is that, 16, 12, 16 bucks a day? Yeah. That becomes a significantly reduced operational expense. I mean, and that is a huge game changer for most organizations. And so the cloud, what I want you to think about is it's not about does the cloud make sense or not. It's if we didn't have to worry about managing a server, backing it up, replicating it, directing traffic, or paying for it. Because essentially the cloud does have a cost, don't get me wrong, but it's usually significantly less than whatever you're paying to run it on-prem. And the important thing to remember is the cost to go in the cloud is never going to go up. The cost to go on-prem is never going to go down. And so <clears throat> as we look at those different options and you start to remove those barriers to your thought process, now you start to think, well, if I'm really doing you know, per minute per hour pricing, now that makes a lot more sense. Now I can run workloads just for part of the time. I can run workloads on much more machines and then shut them down. And I can get a lot more flexibility uh, in what I'm doing. And we're able to do that because we have lots of features like load balancing and high availability. We get availability sets. Um, a lot of these are very easy to configure. They're literally wizard-based or, again, through PowerShell. You can do them automatically. We get Windows Azure Virtual Networks, which are very exciting. These are really easy to configure. I wrote a PowerShell script the other day to configure one of these in about five minutes. Uh, you can upload an XML file with the configuration, or you can do it right through the Azure portal, which I'm going to give you a quick little tour of here in just a couple of minutes. 
but it lets you define your own IP ranges. You can be compliant with your corporate IT security policy. Uh, speaking of security, you know, this brings up a good point. A lot of people like to tell me they don't think the cloud is secure. And I think that's a load of something, right? Because it's a couple of things. One, especially when you're talking about Azure, I would, I would recommend you go check out the Azure Trust Center. If you go type that into Bing, you'll find it pretty quickly. That's a list of all of Microsoft's compliance, security, certification, uh, awards, and, uh, and registrations. They are the most secure cloud. They are also recently, uh, they just got recently awarded the only cloud platform that complies with all of the European Union's privacy uh, and compliance regulations. That's yeah, in many, huge. In many you're right, Adam. In, in many cases, they're more compliant than most premise-based solutions as far as security. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, I mean, I guarantee if, if you pulled 15 random companies, 10 of them, I could make it into their data center if I just walked right. into the room. Yeah, and I guarantee I can't walk into an Azure data center. Well, it's, it's interesting when you have it up here. I was just thinking that you know the the adoption of cloud feels very much like the adoption in the early days to to virtual machines, right? Uh, when VMware first came out, uh, boy, well, I I can't remember the year, but it was it was two thousand three, maybe around those. Don't years. do it. It's making me feel old. Yeah, I know, I know. But you know, back <laughs> then you would hear, oh no, it can't perform. It it it's not scalable. It, we use right. a test dev, all that sort of thing, and it's you're feeling the same thing here. I mean, one of the knee-jerk responses to cloud was always, oh, what about security? What about my data? And over the last four or five years, they have certainly addressed it. In fact, in many cases, over-addressed it, as you pointed out. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I think, I think the, the metaphor about the virtualization is really true. You and I have talked about that before. And, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, I don't think anybody's saying, go take your, you know, your OLTP you know, back in tier one app and make that your first foray into a new platform, right? You never would have done that in, in, in a virtualization world. You're not going to do that with cloud. But I would encourage you to think not about the, I don't think I can or I can't. Get rid of those in your vocabulary. and Start thinking about what you can do uh, and take those first steps. We've got some great offerings to actually help our customers do that. We'll talk about those in a little bit. But the rich hybrid scenarios that we can deliver where you have some of the app on-prem or some apps on-prem and some in the cloud and they work together is a very, very powerful story. And we can do that through things like virtual gateways. Uh, there's everything from software-based solutions. Microsoft even has hardware-based solutions for extra high traffic. Uh, they've worked with uh, telco providers like AT&T and Verizon and others to have, have uh, things called, I think it's called Express Route, uh, where you get you know, additional capabilities for routing through your telco directly to uh, in Azure Data Center, so there's some very, very cool and powerful things uh, that are happening there. I think the important thing overall is, I don't feel, I mean, Tim, certainly from a Pragmatic Works perspective, if I want to make sure I can route direct to our data center, even across town, I'm going to have to call Comcast, and we're going to have to lay dark fiber, and that's going to be just hugely cost prohibitive for us, right? So immediately we're going to say, we, we can't do that. We've got to think of a different option, right? right? And when we oh, deploy absolutely. things to the cloud, crazy, yeah. we've got these options. Yeah, yeah, there's no way, right? A dark fiber on an expense report, I'm sure that would go really well. So, you know, when we have some of these other options, these virtual gateways and some of these express route things, Microsoft's doing the heavy lifting, you know, with their bulk for you, right? They're knocking down roadblocks ahead of you, you know, six to 12 months out so that these are things that they know you have concerns about, but they're making it so that you don't have to be concerned. And I think that's the that's one of the things that's made it you know very very powerful. We talked about automation. Uh, they've actually done a really nice job publishing a lot of scripts and automation uh, white papers and frameworks and those kinds of things. I'd encourage you to go out there and check it out. I have yet to go look for something that I need to do in the Azure platform uh, and not been able to find it. So that's actually uh, that's a pretty good pretty good vote for me uh, that they're doing a good job. If you have MSDN memberships, which I'm sure a lot of you do, most organizations have at least a few MSDN memberships for you know our developers and our, our uh, operations folks. Uh, you don't need a credit card to sign up for an MSDN membership. You also get credits. We'll talk about those. Uh, and there's discounted rates for dev test scenarios. So even even the the paltry amount sometimes that we're paying for some of these systems, we get up to a 97% savings uh, in certain dev test scenarios, which is also pretty exciting. And you'll see, just to give you a kind of an idea, at $100 per month with Visual Studio Premium, 
Uh, that MSDN credit will let you run three VMs all the time for 16 hours a day or 500 websites plus a SQL database to back it up. I mean, there's some, there's some pretty compelling things there. So we're not talking about a credit where you're going to go in and build one tiny little thing and then credit expires and everything's over. Uh, they're really giving you some tools to be able to explore and, and do some powerful things. Uh, again, I'll use myself as an example. I have my own Azure account. We also, of course, have our Pragmaticworks Azure account. And I get a $150 credit through my MSDN every month. And then because I'm an MVP, actually, I think they give me a little bit more. I think I get a $200 credit per month. I run all of my demos and all of my VMs and my HD Insight clusters, and I probably have, I don't know, 120 things deployed up in Azure. Uh, and I do, I try to be smart. You know, I shut them down when I can. Sometimes I forget, you know, just like any other organization because I haven't had time to go and perfectly automate my own personal account. I have never gone above my credit. <laughs> and you guys know how many presentations we do and how many, uh, you know, if you've seen how many different things I've been putting out there about different things that around big data and compute and Azure. There's, there's a lot of work that can be done in these environments, especially in dev test. I'm a great example for dev tests uh, because that's, I spend a lot of time doing that. And you can, you can really just use that credit, uh, no cost to the company. Uh, it's very, very exciting. So none of this, you know, which broke down tired old server. I mean, Tim, we've had this conversation here, right? Which, which ancient server are we going to try to use for dev, <laughs> right? And, you know, dev is one of those exciting right, things. Like none. <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, and, and dev is, is someplace that shouldn't be shortcutted, right? We should, that's where we're creating, that's where we're innovating. I mean, Pragmatic Works has so many awesome software tools. We don't want to, we don't want to shortcut the folks that are actually developing those tools. We want them to have what they need to, right? So that, you know, that's really a, um, you know, when I was at Toyota, we used to say development is production, because it is. If you have software developers working in it, it's production. They can't do their job, uh, you know, without a great environment. Azure gives you the availability, the performance, and just super low cost to be able to do that. Uh, and that lets you focus on apps and not infrastructure. All of the C-level folks that we talk to, and I, I know all is a dangerous word, but it really is all. And they want to focus more on being able to innovate. They want to drive the business. They want to focus on applications and deployments, not on the infrastructure itself. Where are we going to put it? Which rack? And do we have space in the rack? The worst thing you can go in and tell a C-level executive when you're talking about a deployment is, we got to wait another week because we don't have room in the rack. And these are real conversations that are happening, you know, and that puts the entire business behind a week. I mean, most, most folks can't really quantify what that means in terms of revenue, but the C-level folks can. I mean, <clears throat> you know, Tim, if we had to wait on a whole new rollout for two weeks just because we had to deploy something here in our, our data center, that really sets us back, right? We're planning to be able to roll that out, right? Sales team, you know, has to has to be uh, updated. You know, deployments and deliverable schedules all have to be updated, and that can cause us a real challenge. Oh, absolutely! I so mean, we I get a lot of you know, many of you probably see. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, a little go ahead, No, go ahead, Tim. There, Adam. <laughs> I was going to say, any delays, you're right. As far as we rolling out of new uh, products and services that we offer, uh, it, we couldn't wait for this. And it's, that's the nice thing about being in a cloud uh, environment. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, the other day we wanted to test something having to do with SQL 2014. And our production environment here uh, is running on SQL 2012. And the particular thing we wanted to test was a new 2014 feature that had to do with, uh, you know, some in-memory OLTP and some, <clears throat> some column store. And, we said, oh, we don't have any room on prem. We said, why are we even thinking about that? We just threw up a VM. We had a VM up with SQL 2014 installed from a gallery image, which is a, which is a nice image Microsoft gives you right out of the box, uh, in about six minutes. So I would challenge any DBA on the planet to deploy me an entire new server with six cores and 16 gigs of RAM, highly available, geo-replicated to three continents, and SQL 2014 completely installed in six minutes. That's, that's pretty good. I'm, I was pretty impressed with that. Even seven minutes I'd have been okay with, right? And so we have all these application building blocks, and as you think about moving your applications to the cloud, you know, a lot of folks are starting with their data, right? SQL database consolidation, moving apps into the VM world, uh, but we've got HG Insight, which is Microsoft's uh, Hadoop distribution. We've got SQL databases. We have Azure storage, tables and queues, and just regular blob store. We have Traffic Manager, which allows routing and load balancing. 
cloud services to give you that sort of virtual uh, picket fence around all of your data to make sure that things stay in the right data center and that they fail over together. Cache and content distribution networks. Active Directory so that your cloud environment and your on-prem environment have their identity systems integrated. That's a huge, huge benefit. Uh, of course, we have Azure websites. Uh, my personal website runs as an Azure website, and, and I, I really, I really enjoy it. It's a really uh, good experience. Mobile services, media streaming, Azure Service Bus, BizTalk, all of these things that we know are critical to organizations uh, to be able to build out the next generation of globally scalable apps. They're really, really uh, important to be able to combine and work with uh, not only your on-prem environment, but also your cloud environment. And so, of course, we have Azure SQL Database, uh, which is a platform-based relational SQL Server engine in the cloud. It's clustered for high availability. It's a fully managed service. You manage it through Management Studio, and it looks, acts, and smells exactly like your on-prem server. Uh, are there certain things that it doesn't do that your on-prem server does? Well, sure. There's a couple of features that it doesn't have, and there's some T-SQL things that are coming up to speed. Uh, but again, like I said, in most of our migration scenarios, not an issue. Uh, there's some great assessment tools uh, that between us and Microsoft we have to bring to bear to help uh, you know, make sure that there aren't going to be any issues with a deployment. And because it's a managed service, it allows you to scale it up or scale it down, which is very exciting. So if you have a month end, for example, and you need a lot more horsepower to a particular group of databases, that's absolutely possible. And you can automate that through PowerShell as well. So you know, you know that on the 27th, it's going to start to climb. On the 25th, let's start to add some of that capacity, get it going in the next couple of hours, and make sure that we're not going to get a call from upstairs saying, why is the site running slow, or why are these other things running slow? We've also got Azure websites. Now, typically, Microsoft has been a, you know, we do our stuff really well. We don't support a lot of other things. With the cloud, they've, they've gone way beyond that. And so they support things like Node.js and PHP. And we can deploy with things other than TFS, like Git or FTP and additional tools. And again, easily scale it up as the demand grows. Uh, one of the migrations I was involved in last week, we really leveraged this auto-scale functionality that's built into Windows Azure. And we said, look, you're going to be able to auto-scale every, every time the site hits 80% on one of these back-end instances, you're going to add another two or three instances just to make sure that we can handle the load. Uh, it's based on real-time usage. We get a queue depth measurement that we can work with, and it supports scheduled times. That's pretty exciting. I, don't, I know that building something like this is possible on-prem, but it requires system center. It requires a ton of code, and it requires constant management. This you can set up in about two and a half minutes right through this little GUI interface here, or, of course, you can automate it through PowerShell. Totally different experience. And again, because we're not doing it on-prem, we're still only paying for minute per hour compute, and uh, we're driving a, a much better cost and ROI for our organization. We've got a really nice DevOps workflow from development to deployment to operate to learning and all the way around. Uh, low cycle time, very repeatable. Uh, and we can do that because we have additional tools like Visual Studio Online uh, with TFS and Git support. We have Elastic Build Service, continuous integration. So when you're working with Azure websites, there's these uh, staging slots where you can move sites in and stage them up to production. And there's some very exciting capabilities there. We can do load testing right from VSO, right from Visual Studio Online. Uh, team room collaboration, Agile project management features. There's a lot of, especially, you know, Tim, like you mentioned, there's a, there may be a delay in some of the enterprises moving, but the, the medium-sized or mid-market business is really well poised for this. And these are a lot of things that, in some cases, they're trying to do better than their enterprise counterparts. And this type of technology allows them to do it completely in the cloud and with Visual Studio on-prem and gives them a very exciting solution. Well, absolutely. In fact, that the, was primary um, uh, option for us here at Pragmatic Work. So you, you're absolutely right, that mid-market is heavily into the cloud. So from a, from a storage perspective, that's one of the areas where we really get the biggest bang for our buck. So storage is continually getting cheaper. That's one. Two, we have a highly scalable, durable, available storage system. So all of this work that everybody has done to get the SANS propped up and all of these expensive tiered storage solutions can't deliver 
on some of these highly scalable and durable uh, requirements that we get when we use Azure Blob Store. Uh, we can get client applications to access it, things like Hadoop clusters, uh, line of business applications. We've got import export services with physical drives. If you've got lots of data, they can go up to Microsoft and actually physically import the data as opposed to sending it over HTTP. We can expose data over HTTP, JSON, OData feeds, cores. Um, there's all sorts of capabilities to be able to leverage the storage. We've also got Active Directory in the cloud. So like we mentioned, being able to integrate your on-prem identity management with Active Directory, single sign-on within your applications, it supports all of your common uh, application authentication uh, protocols that you're going to build into your application. Uh, this works hand-in-hand uh, -hand with some of the solutions where we've been able to deploy BI in the cloud for a lot of customers. And that uh, is really required for things like analysis services and other things, SharePoint, uh, to be able to manage SharePoint in the cloud. And it works really well. And the ability to drive that and to drive those BI applications really comes back to, one, being able to have a flexible model for uh, managing our deployment and compute. So how do we deploy these, uh, these services and these virtual machines? We can deploy everything from your uh, relational engine, your ECL, your OLAP layer, your reporting, and your SharePoint layer, and consume it with Office 365 all in the cloud in a way that you can manage, you have total transparency to, uh, and your admins and developers will also feel very comfortable with. And we can tie all that together with your on-premise environment by using Windows Azure Active Directory. And it's a very simple sync process. Uh, basically, to set it up takes, um, you know, I think the longest time it ever took us to set it up was maybe about half an hour. Uh, works pretty well, uh, very, very seamless for the most part. So uh, it's been a really good experience for us as a, as a delivery partner and as an advisor to our customers to be able to go in and say, we have confidence in this platform, right? I mean, Tim, one of the nice things about, you know, not working for Microsoft is we get to pick our platform, right? And so, you know, we can choose what we think is really going to be the best vehicle uh, for our customers to get what they need. And, you know, for us and for a lot of our customers, you know, Azure has been a really great, powerful story there. Yeah, Microsoft's done a, a really nice job at remaining competitive, too. So from my perspective, you know, it, it's always about dollars and cents, and Adam and I will talk about quality and performance and all of that as well, which is a major factor. But, um, you know, when you go look out there now to the other platform, other uh, options that you have in cloud, Microsoft has become very, very compelling. Yeah, and, and they're very focused on, on it from a compete perspective, right? I mean, most of these right. big vendors, they're all focused on, you know, what do we do better than everybody else? And... You know, Microsoft is really focused on things like scalability, security, uh, and mobility, and, and, you know, the ability to uh, providing a, you know, low friction deployment, right, to so being able to get out and get deployed. Uh, and we've seen that, that we've seen that friction reduce over and over again. Every time we do a new deployment, it seems to get easier. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of best practices and a lot of things that we have learned. Uh, you know, and Tim, like you mentioned, being able to move faster and save money and get that hybrid consistency while you're running some things in the cloud and some things on-prem. And so, you know, we, we kind of titled this uh, deck sort of cloud forward and thinking, you know, as you, as you think, as you move ahead. Pragmaticworks has a number of different areas where, you know, we can, uh, we can add value for you. And uh, so just quickly here at the end, I want to mention we've got solutions around checking your cloud readiness and looking at an ROI analysis. We can help you look at your licensing, your current footprint, figure out what the what your savings and what your future deployments might look like. Things like private and hybrid cloud, so on-prem uh, system center managed private cloud solutions uh, where we get some of the elasticity and uh, elastic spin up, but not, not all of the benefits of a, of a public cloud uh, uh, for some of those applications that can't take advantage of it. Or hybrid cloud solutions where we can have some of the uh, environment on-prem, move some of those tier two, tier three environments uh, up in the cloud. SQL Server cloud consolidation. We have a lot of customers who say, look, we've got SQL databases or you know, access databases or extra databases. They're all over the place. We really need to bring them all into one place. How do we do that? Um, so we've had some pretty exciting uh, opportunities to work with customers around consolidating their environments up in the cloud and doing it in a way that's going to ultimately save them money, not cost them sleep at night because they're worried about compliance and worried about data walking out the door. Uh, and they're 
are able to report on it and really very clearly uh, get through compliance and regulatory hurdles. Of course, we talked about enterprise BI deployed in Azure. For us, you know, we do a lot of BI work, and this is a really exciting opportunity for us to be able to not have customers make sacrifices. We do talk to some customers sometimes, and they'll say, you know, do we, where do we share servers, right? Really, ideally, we need four, and we only have two, and so how do we double up on some of these services? Now we can tell them, don't double up. Just go ahead and get all the servers you need in the cloud. We probably only have to run some of them periodically during the day, but even if we have to run all of them, it's a very, uh, it's a very, it's a much more cost-effective option to be able to do that. Um, again, doesn't really add a ton of time to the deployment of the solution. We use all the native tools. We use all the normal, uh, you know, our blitz methodology that so many of our customers have, have really benefited from and taken advantage of. All of that still applies, which is really exciting. It allows us to be agile, get you results quickly. Uh, it's very, very exciting. Office 365 Power BI design and deployment. Tim, I mean, we're just seeing Power BI is just blowing up, isn't it? It is. It's it's um, it's one of those offerings that we talked about earlier, as far as spinning up, you know, products and services, and uh, largely it's the number one product that's being um, sold by Microsoft this past year. Um, well, they're in their Q4 this year, so many many companies are uh, absolutely moving to you know their Exchange services in the cloud with Office 365. Yeah, big time. And along with that, you've got the Power BI. Options. So many of your companies, and I'm not sure if you're exposed to this or not um, as a DBA or developer, uh, but at the level of the office, you know, suite, it, they're moving to the cloud options, paid by subscriber. So it's it's been a big a big win for Microsoft this year. Yeah, and we're seeing you know what we're seeing is customers that are able to now begin to drive what their enterprise BI teams are doing more directly from the line of business, right? So we used to go through this process of, you know, I think these are the questions I want. Now with Power BI, they can mock all that up quickly and they can access those data sources and get a good sense for what's really going to add value to their business. So the iterations they go through when they move that data over to their enterprise BI solution just mm -hmm. add a lot more value. And that's that's been a very exciting story as well. Last but not least, We've got big data and cloud analytics. Of course, a lot of companies are talking about big data. Pragmatic Works is uh, right in the middle of it. We're doing a lot of exciting things in the Hadoop space. Uh, some of that's on-prem, some of it's in the cloud. There's a lot of exciting benefits to being able to do Hadoop in the cloud, uh, both through HD Insight, which is Microsoft's uh, service-based offering, uh, which has some very exciting uh, features for multiple teams and uh, you know where you're going to have crossover between some of the workloads and even deploying uh, things like Cloudera or Hortonworks in a VM scenario up in the cloud, just to be able to do, again, that test dev methodology, get your feet wet uh, in the technology before you worry about going in and, and investing uh, in physical hardware. Uh, we've got details on all of these types of things out at pragmaticworks.com, like always, so feel free to check those out. Uh, let us know if there's anything that we can do to try to uh, answer any questions you have about how the cloud can help take your organization forward uh, and Tim, I think that's uh, that's where I was going to wrap. So I, I know we left some time for questions, but before we do that, was there anything else you wanted to make sure we touched on? Uh, no, I'm just hoping this was helpful for everybody. Again, give a perspective, a business perspective uh, to the IT changes that are uh, coming towards your organization, and hopefully we got we we um, were able to shed some light on some topics that you hadn't uh, considered before. So. I know there are some questions, and Rachel's going to go ahead and uh, walk through those now for us. Yes, guys. Yeah, we do have a couple questions. And the Great. first one, actually a really good one, because I know this is something I've heard you guys talk about um, a lot. And it is, with, the, uh, with Azure, is the role of the DBA going to go away? No, absolutely not. Uh, we're not getting rid of databases, <laughs> and we're not getting rid of servers, and we're not getting rid of uh, you know, any of the things that need to be managed. Uh, you know, the, the DBAs who are working in our customer organizations who have really embraced the cloud uh, have really started to see the value of being able to focus on the things, uh, I call it getting rid of the grumblers, right? And so there's a lot of things, I was DBA, you know, in, in years past, and, you know, there were things that I just hated to deal with because, you know, it was every time we set up a server, then we also have to set up the replication, and we also have to set up a partner server, and then we have to set up the cluster. And that all became this sort of, you know, grumbly work or grunt work, if you want to think of it that way, work that should largely be automated. Most of the DBAs and data engineers that we talk to, you know, they're, they're really great professionals, and they know their business, and they can really 
you know, there, there's this litany of projects that they want to do, that they know they need to do to really improve the environment and the way the business can, can adapt. And by removing that percentage of the work that's sort of this routine, you know, day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, uh, again, kind of, kind of grumbly work, uh, and letting Azure manage that piece of it, uh, that doesn't mean that jobs are going away. What that means is now those talented folks can begin to apply those talents and grow their talents to drive more for the business uh, and be able to do some more exciting things, set up new environments quicker, help the business respond. Uh, what the business really wants is they don't want to wait for a backlog team of DBAs or developers to create this environment for them. What they want to hear is, yep, we've got that automated, you need an environment, you give me this information, I'll have it up for you by this afternoon. Then let's sit down and figure out what you guys are going to do with it and how you want to be able to leverage it. And that's a much better reaction than, well, make sure you get your change ticket in six weeks ahead of time and, you know, because I have to wait for a change window to go into the server room. And it totally redefines the way uh, that the IT teams are able to react and respond to line of business requests. Uh, and that's been very exciting. Yeah, and I also think just, uh, you know, most of us have been through change uh, in IT. I, I know I've seen everything from mainframe to ERP to Internet to here we are now talking about cloud. And every single time there's a change, there's a career opportunity um, for people as well. So that's, that's a good way to look at this also. Yes, will, you, will your daily tasks remain the same the way they are today? Uh, they won't completely go away, but you certainly are going to have some increased development skills and things that might be needed. So you can prepare for that today and be the be the person who's a you know who's on top when your company looks to move make the move. Okay, great. And we have the same question for the systems admins position. Actually, you know, the sys admins are are in large case pushing for cloud in, in a lot of cases because whether they're folks who really like System Center and, and you know, manage private clouds or, or, you know, deployments already through System Center, Azure is really just another data center to them in a lot of cases. Um, additionally, sysadmins are often the ones that are tasked with, you know, is the SAN up to date? Is the... Oh, Adam, you cut out there a little all bit. patched, you know, how to do... Oh, sorry. When you can get away from having to do things like patching every Tuesday and managing all of those change tickets and managing all of the meetings for the line of business to make sure people know when there's going to be outages and this and that. And managing the additional things that are required for availability and you let the cloud handle that. Now sysadmins can begin to think about, okay, now how do we bring these environments together? What does our next 12 months look like? They can start to be you know, value adding resources as opposed to what they find themselves doing in a lot of cases, which is you know, facilitating the process, right, which is adding its own value. But if we don't have to do that, we can begin to add value uh, strategically and work with the line of business and say, what new apps do you guys want to deploy? What new systems do you want to explore? And what new, you know, uh, you know, types of, you know, solutions and systems are we going to be looking at over the next 24 months? And how do I begin to plan for that? Many sysadmins and storage folks that we talk to they're forced to be reactive all the time because they're constantly digging out from under this. Uh, they're spending maybe 5% of their time being forward-looking and 95% of their time just sort of drinking from the fire hose. What we want to do with the cloud is turn down the faucet on the fire hose and allow them to spend more than that 5% looking ahead, which is going to make uh, whatever platform, whether it's on-prem, whether it's um, you know, OLTP apps, whether it's big data, whether it's cloud, it's going to make whatever thing that they're focused on uh, better for their organization. Because again, like DBAs, they know their business and they know the technology and they're the ones that are there to bring that together. And so we don't want them spending that time, uh, you know, doing admin or availability kind of work. We want them focused on adding value to the business. Okay, great. We don't have any more questions, but we do have an interesting comment from one of our audience members. It's a recommendation of the book called The Big Switch, and it um, goes into what Tim talked about earlier. It is a compare and contrast for internal power production, um, you know, based on, you know, cloud and energy savings. So that's an interesting read for everyone. And that's all of our questions. And thank you so much, Adam and Tim, for a great session.